specializing in industry and new markets. And then in 2015, he signed up to be a volunteer counselor with the Forest Service, and he found that the lookout line was the perfect <laughs> He's had an actual job. <laughs> and this teacher will be his sixth year on Bass Beach Lookout, overlooking the Grand Which, as everyone knows, is the best forest industry ever. <laughs> so here's Mark. Well, let's see if you're able to hear me. Did they wire me up properly? I don't know what to do about that. We lookouts are Luddites. Well, if you want to use this, this is still on. And I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> oh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Not really? Can you hear me now? Uh, should I just use that? So let's go and turn that off. Okay. How's that? Better. Better? Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is um, this is a little terrifying, actually. <laughs> You realize that I'm, I'm somebody who thinks the perfect life is to sit on top of a mountain all by myself all summer long. And this room has more people in it than have ever been to Baptiste Lookout. And so you guys need to be patient with me because I'm going to completely forget what I was going to say. Um, but we'll give it a shot anyway. I'd like to thank Nancy for that kind introduction. And I'd like to thank the Northwest Montana Lookout Association folks for inviting me up here today. Um, I winter in Bozeman, and the way Bozeman is, is nowadays, it's always nice to get out of there for a little while <laughs> and get back to the Flathead, which is a place that I've loved for close to 50 years now. And I can't wait to get back for another summer at Baptiste. So I'll start with a picture of what is actually the best duty station in the entire Forest Service system. Nancy was right. This is Baptiste Lookout. And I was wondering how many of you folks had been to Baptiste. Anybody? Holy crap. <laughs> That's a lot of folks. Well, if you haven't, um, consider this your official invitation to come up this summer, uh, provided you bring snacks, and provided you don't tell any out-of-staters <laughs> that the place exists. Um, how many of you have been to look at any other lookouts? Oh my gosh, you guys are groupies. Um, have any of you actually actually staffed lookouts before? Oh man, <laughs> I am impressed and now even more intimidated than ever. <laughs> um, I want to thank Chell Peterson in particular for talking me into this, although I'm going to have to figure out a way to get revenge on him later. Uh, for that. He's the guy who really ought to be up here instead of me. I feel underqualified to talk about lookouts, um, especially since Chell said that I should just tell stories from my summers at Baptiste, which I am absolutely not going to do um, because I want to keep working there. So instead, <laughs> what I'm going to do is talk about the history of what it's like to be a fire lookout. Um, it's a topic that I think a lot of people are interested in, but that hardly anybody has done much research on. And I think that's kind of a travesty. And um, what I'm going to try to do tonight is give you a little bit of an introduction to what it was like to be a fire lookout during the, during the heyday of the fire lookout era, you know, 80 to 90 years ago. And then we can compare it a little bit with what it's like today and discover 
spoiler alert, it's almost the same, which is just the coolest thing ever. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about how I became interested in Lookouts by way of introduction, um, because I've had so many people who aren't part of this fraternity ask me what the heck I was doing with my life. Um, <laughs> Uh, you don't get it unless you've actually been to one of these places. Um, I, uh, if, if any of you know of Doug Peacock, you're a, you're a knowledgeable crowd. Um, he was talking to me once and he said that um, he started out fairly high on the government ladder and tried working his way down as far as he could until he was finally <laughs> happy. And being a fire lookout was that spot. And I totally get that, but I was introduced to the, the whole concept at a much younger age, as Nancy mentioned. I grew up in a Forest Service family down in Region 4, uh, primarily in Idaho and Wyoming. And in 1966, I was eight years old, and my dad was working here at the Chalice National Forest Supervisor's Office. And every Saturday, my mom would make a picnic lunch and we'd pile into the International Travel Hall and head up into, into the mountains on the new forest road. And we'd go off and eat that lunch in the trees somewhere. I show this picture because my little sister hates it, <laughs> um, even after 50 years. Um, so one of those days, we, uh, we headed up Chalice Creek and ended up at a place called Twin Peaks Lookout, which is uh, two or three hours outside of Chalice. And it's a good 10,000 feet high. This was the first lookout I ever got to see. And we drove up there. And since my dad worked for the Forest Service, we got right in. And the kid at the lookout was probably just terrified that somebody from the, from the, from the SO was up there to see what he was doing. But I was just enchanted by the whole thing. I mean, here you are on top of this mountain peak, all by yourself with a view that stretched into infinity. And I was just, I was hooked right then and there. And that was close to 60 years ago now. And it hasn't really changed all that much. I kept visiting lookouts with my family when I was a kid. Um, I'm the handsome guy on the left in this shot. <laughs> uh, that's down on the chalice as well. And even after we we ended up going back to the regional office and I stopped getting to visit these places. They stayed in my mind. Um, and I ended up going to college for history, uh, getting a graduate degree in that. And one of, the first, one of the first jobs I got was in Glacier Park as one of the seasonal historians that they had hired back at the time. My job was to inventory historic buildings at the park service owned and so I got to backpack through the park and stay in the cabins and so forth and it was great and I got to look at lookouts and that reignited that interest that I'd held in the back of my mind for for all that time and after that job I spent another 25 30 years doing history and realizing that I was kind of getting tired of that and I wanted to do an early retirement and so what I did is, this was just happenstance, one of those, at about the same time I had that, about the same time I had that revelation, I hiked up to Toma Lookout to see Leif Haugen, who was someone I already knew at the time. And Leif and I were sitting on the porch at Toma, and he said, you know, we've got this volunteer lookout program, and you might not be interested, but I thought I'd mention it to you. And I just grabbed it right away. And so the next summer, um, he sent me up to Baptiste Lookout for two weeks. And the summer after that, I worked a couple lookouts for three weeks. And the summer after that, I volunteered at three lookouts for about six weeks. And then I realized that, um, that my destiny was set for me and I applied for a Forest Service job and I got it. And I've been doing it now ever since. And just like Doug Peacock, I'm at the bottom of the, of the career ladder and I could not be a bit happier. So with all of that, tying the history and my personal interests, 
I've got a few things I'm going to talk about today. And if you didn't want a history lecture, you've come to the wrong place. We're going to talk a little bit about the introduction of the concept of Montana Fire Lookouts, how those lookouts operated, and what's most interesting for me, who those early lookouts were and how they lived. Then we'll head forward to the present, talk about the decline of the lookout system, and then do a quick look at how the lookouts in the Flathead National Forest operate today. Okay? You guys probably know about this place. This is the Guardian of the Gulch. Um, it's known as one of the earliest fire lookouts in the state. Um, parts of it, at least, you know, date from the 1870s still. And it probably is the oldest lookout, but of course it was looking for structural fires rather than, um, rather than wildfires. And so I'm not sure it qualifies, but it's the thing that we all look at when we talk about the beginning of the history of Montana fire lookouts. Um, most people consider the year 1910 to be the beginning of the fire lookout era in Montana. That was the year of the big burn, which I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, consumed so much of the forest land in Northern Idaho and Northwestern Montana. And nationally, it was a wake up call uh, to the Forest Service and other land management agencies that they were going to have to contend with wildfire, you know, that it was going to be a problem for them. And that there was a pretty significant groundswell of public interest in doing something about that. And so that was what really kickstarted the lookout system in Western Montana into operation. But it was already going at that point. This lookout is the one that's generally considered the oldest in Montana. It's down on the old Cabinet National Forest um, in the Clark Fork country. And the building in front uh, here apparently dates from 1910, same year as the fire. Um, and it was staffed um, in that building initially. And then you can see one farther up the hill that was built later and that is uh, subject for future restoration by our Lookout Association friends. So I took a look at that um, and discovered that it probably is the oldest extant building, but they were staffing Lookout spots well before that. This is an article um, from 1909 that talks about that spot and that they um, had people camped on that mountain to watch for fires. And that was the norm at that time. So the earliest lookouts didn't have buildings to envelop them. Um, they, they might have had a wall tent, um, and they had a telephone line, and they had a bunch of tools to fight the fire themselves. And this is the one that I know about, but I am pretty certain that there were others in Western Montana at the same time. And you can see from the article that they were already excited about the concept, pleased with the fact that people on top of mountains were able to spot fires quickly and get them out quickly. The, the oldest um, source for what might be a, a lookout in this part of the world uh, comes from this article that was in the Whitefish Pilot in, um, <clears throat> pardon me, 1912. And it talks about the same sort of thing. Uh, this would have been up in the Northern Whitefish Range on what is now the Teton National Forest. And they were doing the same thing. Um, they um, built a trail, built a telephone line, put a couple guys on top of the mountain and told them to, told them to go for it. There were probably a number of those throughout our part of the world, um, not all of which have even been documented. It would have been an interesting life to live, on, live in one of those places in a tent. Here's, um, here's a page from an early Forest Service report um, a couple of years after that. This is a fire just outside of where, of where Baptiste Lookout is today. Um, you can see the fire 
up Felix Street there. And it was a document that talked about the effectiveness of the fire lookout system at the time. And by that point, the area around what is now Hungry Horse Reservoir had not one or two, but three operating lookout posts um, in the early 1910s. One was at the current site of Baptiste Lookout, one was on Mount Aeneas, and one was on Desert. And the idea was that those three spots could combined look into the entire South Fork drainage. And um, it worked. Here's, a, here's what the report says. And um, it talks at pretty significant length about how good the system was, about how it, it needed to be expanded, <laughs> how it needed to grow. Um, the folks at Baptiste Lookout, they didn't have a building. Uh, they had a trail that went right up the side of the mountain, straight up the side. Um, they had a wall tent, and they might have had a firefinder sitting on a stump, like that. Um, I had spent a lot of time looking for that stump, but I can't find it. <laughs> if you go to Baptiste today, you can see a... a, a a little rectangle about a dozen feet long that's been cut into the side of the mountain, dug into the side of the mountain. It's a perfect rectangle, and that has to be where the tent was, where those folks lived. And then you hike up the side of the ridge about 50 feet, and you come to those rocks, and so that's where they would have spent their days. They did that for actually quite a long time. Um, the only documentation that I've seen for the construction of the first lookout tower at Baptiste places it at about 1928. And by 1928, the fire lookout system was evolving pretty rapidly in the Flathead country. Uh, they were, re were getting rid of the wall tents and replacing them with cabins like this one. And um, there were probably two to three dozen of those by the 1920s. And then they started to move to more standardized designs. You guys have probably all been to Hornet Lookout based on how knowledgeable you are. Yeah. And um, this is a design that's pretty typical of early 1920s fire lookouts. The cupola style um, is one that was easy to build using local materials. Uh, they could just send a crew up there to cut down the trees on site and assemble the lookout pretty quickly with, without too many imported components, not much lumber had to be hauled up the mountain. And um, there were a ton of these as well. This lookout celebrated its 100th anniversary um, in 2023 and is the oldest survivor in our part of the world. Um, it's, a, it's a predecessor of of the design you see here. This is double arrow lookout done by Seeley Lake. Um, it's what's called the L4 design. Uh, the Forest Service's national office compiled a set of standardized blueprints for lookouts in the 1920s and used them throughout big chunks of the country. The L4 was extremely common throughout the Pacific Northwest states, um, in region one especially. Um, there were hundreds and hundreds of these things. And they um, were quite a bit different from the log cabins because um, they were cut from, cut from manufactured lumber that was produced at a lumber mill. Um, what they did, if you've, if you've heard about the Sears homes that, that were so popular back at the time, where they would construct a kit, um, all the lumber was pre-cut all the pieces were numbered and packaged up. And that's what they did with lookouts back then. Um, you'd get um, about three or, four, three or four mule loads worth of cut and numbered lumber along with a set of plans. And they would be delivered by rail to the closest spot where you needed to build a lookout. And then they would be taken by truck to the trailhead and then put on mules and hold up the mountain. The, if your lookout was on a tower, the tower legs were cut locally from logs that were obtained on site. 
a lot of those old lookouts came from came from a mill in Spokane, but there was one in Columbia Falls that also produced those things. And that's where the Flathead got most of their early lookouts. So this is Bungalow Lookout, which was in the Bob. It was known as one of the one of the most isolated and remote lookouts anywhere in the United States. Would have been really cool to have seen that. So these are a couple shots of the plans that would have been used. Um, very simple designs, um, 196 square feet, and all the parts matched from one lookout to another. All the furniture matched as well. Everything was pre-designed, so you would go into one lookout and it would look exactly like all the others. In the center of every lookout was a fire finder. There was room for a bed, a stove, a desk, and some cabinets. And that was a pretty much it. Here's a shot of one of the one of the crews sending up the construction materials for a lookout. Um, the tower legs, the pieces had to be cut short so that they would fit on the mule and then put together once once they were on site. They did this until the 1950s, interestingly enough. Um, but by 1953 or four, uh, they updated the system. They were taking the lookout parts to Missoula, loading them onto an old McDonnell Douglas DC-3, and flying up to the flathead in the middle of winter. And they would fly to the lookout site, fly over the lookout site low, and toss the lumber out the door. It landed in the snow, cushioning the blow so nothing broke. And it would just sit there for six months until the snow melted. And then they'd send a bunch of guys up there to put the thing together. It was a great system. It worked beautifully. And it, it, it worked so well, and people were so excited about it. And fire management seemed more and more and more important. Um, that the flathead, like, like most all national forests, really, they went a little nuts with lookout <laughs> construction. This is a map. Um, you can see Hungry Horse Reservoir there on the upper, upper left uh, of like the top quarter of the Bob country and part of what's now the Great Bear. And those are all lookout sites. And I don't think this map even has all of them. Um, from the research I've been able to tell, there were probably between 100 and 150 fire lookouts in, in the Flathead at, at its peak during the Depression years, probably closer to 150. Um, they weren't all staffed at exactly the same time. You know, a few were, few were abandoned before others were built. But 150 lookout sites just on the Flathead. Today we staff seven, which is, which is more than most national forests still staff. Um, the lookouts were almost all of the L4 design that we just looked at at this time. These were mostly built during the late 1920s, early, early 30s, and up until the beginning of the World War II era. Um, this, I, I put this in because it's a way to show what kind of a landmark these things were. On the Flathead and then on a few other forests, they would write the name of the lookout in, in painted rocks right below the side of the building. You can see those on a number of abandoned lookout locations in the Flathead as well. And it was, the, it was considered the primary navigation aid, aid for aircraft in that era before radio navigation, um, especially for service aircraft. You, you could fly along and you'd see that letter and then you'd know where you were. And I always just thought that was super cool. But the lookouts were only a part of that whole enterprise of trying to protect the flathead against fire. Um, every lookout needed a trail to it, for example. And you didn't, you had to have a trail that didn't just go to the lookout, but also went to any place there might 
possibly be a fire. And then you needed some kind of communication. And so every lookout needed a telephone line to it. And the telephone lines were, of course, all the single strand things that kind of ran through the trees alongside the trail. Um, you can still see wire all over the place if you start looking for it in the flathead. And so constructing 150 lookouts meant constructing, <clears throat> pardon me, make, pardon me, meant constructing many hundreds of miles of trail um, and many hundreds of miles of telephone line. And keeping all that going was a tremendous enterprise, especially the phone lines, because they were just, they were just out there running through the trees and every time a tree fell down, the phone line would break. And then the, and then the lookout couldn't, couldn't, couldn't talk to anybody, couldn't communicate. And so a lot of lookouts would spend a good chunk of their summer walking the length of the phone line, looking for the spot that broke and climbing up the tree and splicing it. Um, but the telephones were incredibly important to them because we didn't really have radio until after the Second World War. And I threw this in just to show all the trails that were in that part of the, of the forest at the time. Um, a few of them are still there and a lot of them are just completely gone. Trails in the early Forest Service years were of different classes, class A, class B, class C. Um, the most heavily used trails were class A trails and they were designed on an engineered gradient designed to accommodate pack stock. Um, designed for regular use. Um, the trails to most of the lookouts fit in that category. You get down to the class C trails, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're basically just um, established routes through the forest. There's no grading, you can follow the blazes along the trees. And those were the ones that people would use when they were out trying to locate fires and to fight fires. Um, We'll go one more here. <laughs> I love this one. Um, the two pictures I just showed you are, are evidence of a couple of things that are probably already obvious to you, but if they're not, they should be by now. And that is that all fire lookouts are incredibly devilishly handsome. <laughs> and that we're all impeccably groomed. Um, you will never see a fire lookout who is not perfectly shaven in a suit and tie with a button-down collar and smoking a lucky strike. But it, it, the interesting thing about that though is that it shows that people were aware of the, of the job. And that there was, a, even at this early date, there was a little bit of romance attached to the job. If you're cool enough to be a fire lookout, you're cool enough to smoke luckies. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty darn cool. <laughs> so what kind of people staffed fire lookouts? Um, basically, during the early years, it was a pretty significant recruiting challenge for the Forest Service. You think you had to find several dozen people who would be willing to go out into the, into the wilds for two or three months and sit in one of those towers. Um, it was a hard thing to do. And in my research, I've discovered there are basically three categories of people who staff fire lookout towers at the time. There were a few folks like this couple. These um, folks staffed Twin Peaks Lookout back in Idaho, the one that I first saw. Um, they were older. Um, often husband and wife. Um, they lived in the area. A lot of them had ranches or farms that were pretty marginal places that didn't really give them enough to sustain themselves. And they could find a, a little bit of cash income by spending the summer working the fire lookout. Sometimes the wife would stay at home, sometimes the kids would stay at home and take care of the farm. And they'd send send the father or sometimes, the, sometimes both the parents up to the mountain. These two people were um, at Twin Peaks for decades and people would drive up from Chalice you know, a couple hours away just to get a piece of her lemon pie. Um, it was highly, highly recommended. 
Um, here's one more shot of the two of them. There were a few families too. Um, not, not very many, but often it was the same situation. They were almost all local folks. They needed the money and were willing to take on the sacrifice of being away from their homes, away from their town, their communities, uh, to earn that money. It was not an easy life for folks like that, but it was one that they did because they had to, had to do it. Um, there were a few folks who did it long enough and hard enough and that they became that they became pretty well known themselves. And you've probably all heard of Scotty Beaton, who was up on Newer Ridge for um, a couple decades. And he was in a way the same situation. He started off looking for the extra income and then it became a part of him to be on that mountaintop. And that's what he's remembered for today. And probably for those muffins too. Um, there was a second group, um, and those were university students. University of Montana has a forestry school, and there were a few others. University of Minnesota was another one. Um, and if you were going to forestry school, you needed to get a summer job for the Forest Service. And so every, every June, a crop of University of Montana students would head out to the forests for a summer doing fire lookout work. Um, they saw it in a completely different way than did the older folks. They saw it as a way to advance themselves. And they also saw it as a way to have some, have some fun. This picture is in here because you probably didn't know this, but the University of Montana had its own fire lookout. This was on Mount Sentinel. Um, and it burned down, unfortunately. But people who, who went to the university's forestry school served as lookouts for these many decades, many decades. They would do that probably at the beginning of the university career. And then in subsequent summers, they'd move on to something that was a little more complex, a little bit more professional. It was a way to integrate them into the job of being a professional forester. So those two categories of people were in the minority um, of all the lookouts that were hired up there. The vast majority of lookouts during those early years were, were kids, basically. Uh, the average lookout at, in the 20s and beyond was an 18-year-old boy from a small town in western Montana who was looking for an adventure. And that was probably the best answer of all because they were thrilled to be out there. They were away from home for the first time. They were all alone. They were experiencing the transition from being a kid to being an adult. And they were doing it on top of a mountain on their own terms. And that's about as cool as it can get. You start looking through the biographies of these people and you find that without, almost without exception, these kids were having the time of their lives up there, even though nothing was happening. Um, they were on their own. They were away from the family. They were experiencing the world for the first time. And when I did this research, the interesting thing that I found was that you start Googling fire lookouts. And of course, one thing you find are a lot of are a lot of obituaries um, that use those terms. And a lot of the people who staff lookouts, they'll put that in their obituary as a highlight of their life. They might not tell you what they did for the next 50 years, but those two months, <laughs> those two months they spent on Bungalow Peak in the Flathead were something that they held on to. And I think that's, it's super cool. That really is. And as you start looking, you find more and more pictures like these. And I just love them. <laughs>
a lot of fire lookouts in other parts of, of the West, probably not quite so many here in Montana, were staffed actually by more than one person. Um, this shows how that worked. Uh, there was one guy up there who watched for fires. And there was a second guy that got dispatched to go and put the fire out, the first person found. Um, that was a very common thing. Um, the people who went, went out to put the fires out are not the professional fire folks that we're lucky to have in the Forest Service today. They were those same 18 year old kids with just a little bit of training and a Pulaski and a bladder bag of water maybe, and that was it. And almost no direction as to how to even find the smoke. Um, their companion would just point and off they'd go. <laughs> no matter what time of day or night, um, without, often without communications even. It was pretty remarkable. Here in the Flathead, um, similar procedures happened, but we had 150 lookouts. And so uh, if the person who was on Baptiste saw a fire, it would likely be on the other side of the river over by Pioneer Ridge. And so they'd call the Pioneer Ridge lookout and say, you know, there's a smoke over there. And so the poor guy at Pioneer Ridge would get pulled out of bed and he'd have to go put the thing out. Um, it was a hard life. The lookouts at the time were almost all inaccessible by road. Today, um, the Flathead is pretty unique in that most of its lookouts are only reachable by trail. Um, in most of the West these days, you can drive to a fire lookout, and that's what most people think. You just get in your pickup truck and drive in. But um, you almost always had to hike, and that meant a couple things. One, it, one thing it meant was that you had to pack everything you needed for the summer on a couple of mules to get up there. The second thing was that once you got up there, you couldn't leave. I couldn't comfortably leave. Um, people would go up generally early July and they'd be there for two months and completely on their own. They were up there too, as well without um, almost exclusively without visitors. You know, nowadays, most fire lookouts get a good number of hikers coming in. Um, back then, that, that just did not happen. You had your horse and a mule and a couple of suitcases on it, and off you went. And you're 18 years old. That's, that's pretty cool. Typically, what would happen um, for those folks is that the Forest Service would set them up with an, someone at the office who was an experienced packer and put the, put, the, put the lookout's personal belongings on a mule. And then in the early years, they would throw in a couple more mules filled with supplies. That was what the lookout was expected to eat over the course of the entire summer um, without really supplementing it with anything. And so the packer would take the kid and haul him up the mountain, drop everything off and disappear. And then, and then the lookout was on his own, sitting up there on top of the mountain, just watching the mules go away for the next two months. <laughs> Exhilarating and scary at the same time. As I said, in the early years, um, all the foodstuffs were typically supplied by the typically supplied by the Forest Service. Uh, once you got a little bit later in the era, um, people who staffed lookouts went to the, to the local grocery store before they headed up, got what they thought was a couple months worth of food, put it on credit, and gave that to the packer. Um, but this is an interesting list because it shows what the government thought a person would be able to live on for the summer. And there's some, there's some good stuff in there, but when you start looking at it with a little bit of um, extra scrutiny, you realize that the lookout is basically gonna live on two things for the whole summer. He's gonna live on potatoes and he's gonna live on, <clears throat> on flour. And that's gonna be the bulk of the, of, of the guy's diet. 
Um, some of the other things in there are treats, but they're in pretty small numbers. You can eat potatoes every single day and you're gonna bake bread and you're gonna learn how to do it and you're gonna like it every single day. <laughs> it's a lot of food though, a lot of calories there. That caused a problem. Um, it was realized right away that if you give an 18 year old kid that set of stuff and send him up there by himself, and it was his first time away from home, uh, it probably was gonna end badly. <laughs> and uh, they, they had an issue where a lot of lookouts were, were getting sick. Um, scurvy sorts of diseases were, <laughs> were starting to happen up there. Um, and so the forest decided that the only, only good solution was to give, give these lookouts instructions on how to, how to cook for themselves and how to eat healthy and how to have appropriate personal hygiene, um, which was something that was also a little bit lacking at the time. Um, if you're an 18 year old boy out by yourself, so, so the Forest Service published a cookbook just for fire lookouts. Uh, they published several editions of it over the course of at least three decades. Um, and they're really pretty fascinating documents. I would they're available on the internet for free as PDF files. And I would encourage anybody who's interested to go digging up for them. Um, I've got them and I've actually used a bunch of the recipes and a lot of them are actually pretty good. It's, it's old school comfort food, uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of fun. I added this, this is kind of a sample page and I, I added it just because I like the last one. It um, gives you instructions on how to cook when the big shots are gonna come up. <laughs> And here's another page from one of the cookbooks. Um, there were, there was a lot of advice on how to handle specific cooking needs, but also on how to stay healthy, what kinds of things you should eat and shouldn't eat to have a balanced diet. I like this one. Um, you should read the paragraph that's titled Fresh Meat. Um, <laughs> I, I have never done that. <laughs> and I probably, probably never will either. But it's an uh, interesting illustration. I did, however, take the cookbook and I, I made these one summer. And I included these pictures, not because I wanted to show my cooking expertise to you folks, but because some of you may not know that the Forest Service has its own China pattern. <laughs> and that is an incredibly civilized thing if you're sitting on a mountaintop in a little shack all by yourself. <laughs> it's cool stuff. And there's a shot of a young man who has read his cookbook and was hard at it. There were other chores of wealth as well, of course. Um, you had to do all kinds of other domestic things. You had to learn how to do them without the conveniences of, um, of a modern home. Um, even one back then that may not have had running water. I think this guy is actually still alive. And so if anybody knows him, don't tell him I posted this <laughs> on the internet, but it's, it's a great shot. Um, one thing that's interesting off to the side is you can see the old milk cans there. And that's um, how many lookouts used to, store, used to store their drinking water. And the rest of a lookout's day um, spent doing the things that I do today you know, watching for fires, using the Osborne Firefinder, which is 
a piece of equipment that is now um, over 100 years old, um, quite little change since its initial design. One that I have at Baptiste is approximately 80 years old now, over that now, getting close to 90. And it still works remarkably well. Um, I have to brag that a typical fire lookout who knows how to use an Osborne can establish a fire's location as well as an aerial observer can. As well as an aerial observer can using a GPS device. So it's, it isn't always the new shiny stuff that is effective. So trying to figure out some other details about these folks' lives, I spent some time looking through old newspaper articles. And in the early years, um, you see stories that editors considered newsworthy, and they were often pretty, pretty tragic stories. I found one of a kid from, from the Minnesota Forestry School who came out here to be a lookout and tried to kill himself five times while on top of the mountain because he couldn't handle the isolation. And on the fifth time, he succeeded. Um, this story, um, I can tell it, but I think you're already reading it. So it's, it's already well said. Um, this is up on NASA coin in the Whitefish Range. A young man who was sent off in the middle of the night to find a fire we were talking about and ran into a grizzly bear. And I'll give you just a second, because it's a great story. You're never going to hike alone at night again after you read it. Are we ready for the next one? <laughs> okay, this is this one is down in the Bob, a place called Pagoda Peak. Um, people always ask me if I've been hit by lightning up there, and I haven't. Although I have, I've got lookout friends who have been in lookout towers when they were struck by lightning, up there and have heard that it's a pretty magical experience. A good way to see God, I think. Um, these two guys were out doing some telephone line repair just a little ways away from the lookout. And the gentleman who was the lookout um, was hit by lightning. And this, this article details his evacuation to the hospital in Missoula. And it's not in this particular article, but he ended up dying from, from that. It's the only lookout that I've been able to find in this part of the world who was killed by lightning. And those were the kind of stories you heard during the early years. Um, we were fortunate after World War II to have Mel Reuter arrive in our part of the world and establish the Hungry Horse News. And he took a real fascination in lookouts, um, along with you know, almost everything else, as we all know. And I've clipped um, a couple of articles that Mr. Reuter wrote about lookouts. And um, this um, gives you an idea of his understanding of the romance of being an early fire lookout. He loved writing about the lonesome boys of the flathead. You'll note at that time, things were getting a little bit more sophisticated. Um, the lookout didn't have to survive for two solid months entirely on his own because the Forest Service was using aircraft at the time. 
and they would drop some perishable supplies, along with newspapers and any mail. Um, so things are starting to get a little fancier. I have asked the Flathead L attack for six years now to bring me a pizza. <laughs> they refuse. So um, we're not moving entirely forward, I'm afraid. <laughs> Here's another article about the person who was um, up on Bungalow Lookout. He found a fire. There was a lot of interest in that particular lookout because at the time it was considered the most remote Forest Service duty station in the country. And I can see that. Nowadays, Jumbo is pretty close to that. It depends on how you how you categorize. Uh, there's a lookout in the Idaho down in the Frank Church that's a little farther away, but you can fly into an airstrip partway. So um, it's still, I think, 22 or 23 miles to Jumbo if you're going the shortest route. And here we are again. Um, Talking about Bungalow a little bit more, it was just about the last lookout to be staffed because it was so remote and so hard to get there because of snow. In those early years, they would staff lookouts incrementally over the course of the summer. Um, nowadays, remaining lookouts are generally staffed about the same period. We open and close them about the same time. But in the early years, they would staff lookouts depending on the snow level. The earliest lookout that the Flathead would staff was a place called McCaffrey Lookout, which is within spitting distance of the intersection of Highway 83 and 35 at Big Fork. Um, they have somebody there in early to mid June. And it was to you know keep an eye on a part of the valley that was not anywhere near as heavily settled as it was today. And then as the summer progressed, they'd staff higher and higher elevation lookouts. And then as the snow came, they start moving back down again. Places like McCaffrey were considered to be hubs of the lookout system. Um, someone at a, a spot that was more remote could get to McCaffrey on the radio um, and where they, where they might not be able to get to, um, get to the ranger station. Of course, nowadays we have repeaters and we don't have to worry about that stuff. And this is a story that is different from all the others I found. One of the flathead, one of the flathead lookouts was the hiding spot for a murderer. This was Ka Mountain, which is on the uh, west side of Hungry Horse Reservoir, most of the way down to Spotted Bear. We had a big fire there last summer. Um, if you kill your wife in Los Angeles and need to hide out, what? What better place to go than a calm mountain? And the interesting thing is he was able to hide for, for months. I really liked Mel Reuter's ending to that story, that a lookout is a serene place for a man to live with his thoughts. <laughs> and it certainly is. If you're looking for anecdotes or information about daily lookout lives, almost all lookouts used to have journals. Um, this, is the, this is the one from Baptiste, and we're not gonna look at that one. Unfortunately, not many of the Forest Service lookouts have survived, of the lookout journals have survived. Um, but we're fortunate in that the ones in the park, the park took very good care to archive and collect it's old lookout journals, and I've spent a ton of time reading them, and they are fun. Um, you guys probably know that Doug Peacock was a lookout in the park for many years, and Edward Abbey spent the summer up on Mini Ridge. So there are a few literary icons up there and lots of ordinary folks who are experiencing um, being 
in the mountains for the first time. So I grabbed um, a page of sample entries here. This is from Porcupine Ridge Lookout, which is one of my favorites in the park. It's um, up above Goat Hunt Ranger Station. Um, very seldom visited and it's an incredible spot. This guy had um, a, a sense of the absurd. <laughs> <laughs> and I think gives you some insight into what a newcomer to the mountains would be thinking. And that's why I don't show you the Baptiste lookout. <laughs> One of the other interesting things is that for a profession that really has never had a huge number of, um, of members, there's a lot of secondary literature about fire lookouts. I talked to you about you know, how you'd see lookouts always mentioned in a person's obituary. And you start looking as well and you find a, a ton of memoirs about those experiences. Um, a lot of the memories are a little faded with time, but they're fascinating stuff. And it speaks again to how important those, <clears throat> pardon me, how important those weeks or months were to a person's overall life. And finally, uh, a few literary folks have spent time on lookouts, and I threw in two quotes from those, uh, giving two different sides of things. Jack Kerouac was um, a fire lookout in Northwest Washington um, in the early 1950s. By all accounts, an absolutely terrible lookout. Um, more interested in you know, everything except watching for fires. But I like this description because he talks about the lookout community, the community of lookouts. The interesting thing was that you were there alone, but at the same time, you knew that there were a dozen or a half dozen other young men also alone sharing those moments with you out of sight, but not out of mind. Um, it creates uh, an interesting bond, and I think one that still exists today. I have some good friends who are lookouts that I might see maybe once a year for a few minutes, or maybe not even at all. But we know that we're sitting on mountaintops looking at the same sunsets, looking at the same, same fires, um, experiencing the same weather. In the early years, um, there were only telephone communications to fire lookouts, of course, the old hand crank phones. And in the evenings, lookouts were often allowed to talk to one another using those telephones. And it was, of course, it was a, it was a giant party line. And they would spend you know, sometimes hours probably talking to one another about the experiences of their day, developing a little bit of kinship. After the radios arrived, um, they used the radio for that. Nowadays, we just use text messaging. <laughs> and this is, uh, this is from Norman McLean. Um, this one speaks to me because it, you know, <laughs> okay, okay. He's out there taking a leak in the middle of the night, but he's experiencing a commonality with his mountain, with the environment around him in a way that is more intimate than you might 
ever do if you're not on a mountain all year. This was a place called Graves Peak, which is down in the Bitterroots, um, in what is now the Clearwater National Forest, just, um, just west of the, of the Montana line. There would be stars enough to brush by him all night. And I, I, I really feel that. You guys in town don't see stars anymore. You really don't. So the lookout era we've been talking about was really, was really pretty brief. Um, most of the lookouts, the early lookouts in the Flathead were built in the 1920s and in the 30s and were heavily staffed through that time and into the Second World War. But the end of the Second World War brought the first era of fairly dramatic change to forest fire management. And it was caused by two different things. One was radio, which we've already talked about. And the second was aircraft. Uh, the Forest Service had a bunch of DC-3s that they owned, others that were contracted out. And um, some forest managers felt that it was more efficient to have those airplanes out looking for fires than to have people on the mountaintops. I would actually argue that, although I'm a little biased. Um, I tell people that um, they can hire me for the entire summer for the amount that it would just cost for three or four hours of airplane time, which is actually pretty close to true. And I'm up there watching 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they can talk to me about what's going on. But an aircraft is new and shiny and it's easy. And so in the years after the Second World War, aerial observation for fires started to be used pretty regularly in the Flathead. And the number of active fire lookouts started to drop fast. Um, in, in the years after World War II, they were still staffing about 50 or so lookouts, which is a pretty good number. But by the early 1950s, um, it was down into the 25 or 30 range. And it continued dropping for the next 20 years. And by the 1970s, uh, the lookout era, as it was known at the time, was just about over. There was a point oh, in the early to mid 90s in, in the Flathead when only two lookouts were staffed. So 100, close to 150 down to two. And um, a lot of forests entirely stopped using lookouts. Um, several Montana's national forests have, have, have no lookouts at all anymore. And so this is what happened. Once the lookouts stopped being regularly staffed, they were pretty rapidly removed from the land by many of the national forests. Um, Especially, that, that happened a lot in the Flathead. Um, there are, are dozens of lookouts in the Flathead that were, that were burned in the years after World War II. Um, at Baptiste, you know, if I were at Baptiste during the Depression years, I could have seen 12 to 13 other staff lookouts during the peak of the lookout era. Um, now I can see one other staff lookout. And the others have all been have all been destroyed, either burned or it collapsed. This is Elk Mountain, which is um, on the border of the Kootenai in the Flathead National Forest. It's a great spot. Up there, you'd like to hike. The interesting thing, though, is that at the same time they were burning so many lookouts, there were still folks who wanted to keep a few lookouts in operation. And the 1960s saw the construction of several new lookouts on the flathead, and those are mostly the ones that still survive today. Um, the old, the old <clears throat> pardon me, L4 design was last used in about 1952, 1953. And this design, this is, this is up at Cyclone Lookout, uh, is a design called the R6. Um, stands for Region 6 of the Forest Service. It's a little bit bigger. It's uh, 225 square feet, 
15 feet square. Um, but it's got a flat roof, which is a little goofy if you're building a building on top of a mountain. And the old timers who have staffed both the old lookouts and the newer ones, and the visibility from the old ones is quite a bit better. Um, I know that every time I see a smoke at Baptiste, there's a window frame right in the way. So, but, but Baptiste and Cyclone and a number of others in our part of the world are, are the R6 design. By the 60s, there were not as many lookouts, but there were still people from some of the categories that we talked about earlier. There were a few families up there, and there were a lot of young men, although by that time, not many teenagers. Um, for the first time, you're, you're starting to see women fire lookouts in the years after World War II. Prior to that, there were a very, very, very tiny handful of them. After the Second World War, Glacier Park in particular decided it wanted to hire married couples to staff lookouts because they felt that that provided a little more stability than if you had an individual up there by himself. And that was very common in the park for, oh, 25 or 30 years. Um, this is a man named Jim Henterley, who is still staffing lookouts today. He's on Desolation Peak in the North Cascades right now. And I just had to throw this guy in because we needed a sample of um, a young man staffing a lookout in the recent times. And he, he took this picture by setting his camera up, <clears throat> pardon me, on a tripod, tying a string to his big toe, <laughs> and <laughs> tripping the shutter with the string. So, as I said, by the, oh, by the 1970s, the lookout era in the Flathead was, for all intents and purposes, starting to end. They constructed the current Baptiste lookout in 1964 and only staffed it for about seven or eight years. By the early 1970s, it was abandoned. And this is how Baptiste lookout looked about 15 years ago. It was a mess, but, um, you know, it was, it was still there. It was at the point where the, where the forest either, either needed to burn it, like they had so many others, or they needed to, to fix it up. Um, and fortunately, they decided to hire Leif Haugen away from the Park Service, and he came in and he restored Baptiste. He restored Toma Lookout, which is where he's at today, and he established the volunteer program that staffs three of the forest lookouts. So between the 1990s and the early 2010s, we went from two lookouts back to seven, uh, which is a fairly unique consequence and something that the forest, I think, needs to be proud of and that something that I hope we can all appreciate as well because the Flathead is helping preserve a pretty cool tradition. And I think that's a great thing. And it's a great thing, not just because we're preserving a tradition, but because these things still have some utility. Um, I had a very busy fire season last year, as you guys probably know, and pretty much all the lookouts in our part of the world called in fires last summer. Um, called them in, called them in well before, in many cases, other folks could have seen them before the aerial observers would have. A lot of fires torch quickly and then die down sometimes for days, and a fire lookout can see it at the time that it torches and you know it's there and an aerial observer will not be able to do that. So I feel very proud of what we've been able to accomplish using our old school OTEC methods. And that I guess is one of my main messages here. I, I'm gonna end this, I've got, some, I've got some pictures of Baptiste because I have to show it off. Um, I'm showing these partly because um, I want to share this place with you guys, but also because when you spend time in a place like this, you develop 
an intimate connection with a small part of Earth. And it's a connection that very few other humans ever get a chance to establish in this day and age. And I think that's just tremendously important. I think it grounds you in a, in a way that the world today tries not to ground you, tries deliberately not to. Um, it's important to be connected with your little corner of the earth. And being a lookout gives us a unique chance to do that. And we do it in a way that is very little changed from the folks we were talking about 90 years ago. I still hike up to Baptiste in June when things are covered with snow. And I open up the shutters and I'm there by myself. And then a few days later, the pack mules come up with my supplies. And I think to myself every time, this is way cooler than Amazon Prime will ever be. <laughs> How many people get their groceries this way? I am so freaking lucky. Once in a while, I get these too. But um, I sit at the desks that people did 90 years ago. I use binoculars as a watch for fires. I drink really bad coffee out of a Forest Service cup. I listen to the transmissions on, on the radio. I call in the weather. I use the fire finder to spot for fires. If you know the significance of the dinosaur, you're part of a very elite group of people. And I call in fires, and I, I watch them. This is the fire that was up Doris Creek last summer. Um, I saw, you know, as, as you, you guys might know, there were several fires around Honduras Reservoir last year. And for the month of August, I was just about the only human along the reservoir um, at night. I had a ringside seat that was just the most remarkable thing. And I was there till the fall when the huckleberry bushes started to turn. And I watched amazing light. And they pay me to be up there. <laughs> a little bit. Just, just, just a little bit. So, where does that leave us? Um, there are only, you know, maybe 200 fire lookouts staffed still in the western United States. Places like the ones that we've been looking at today. Out of, in comparison to several thousand um, that were staffed 80 to 90 years ago. The interesting thing is that um, we should be completely forgotten by now because of that, um, but we're not. We had the New York Times come here last summer to interview a lookout. We had this guy <laughs> <laughs> interviewed by NPR a couple years ago. There's still a romance there um, that the people 90 years ago felt and that society as a whole has forgotten, but that a few of us still understand. And I think almost everyone in this audience feels the same way. And a few years ago, there was a computer game called Firewatch that came out that was one of the best selling computer games of that year. And now, I get, I get emails from kids, teenagers, who want to do exactly what those young men did 90 years ago and want to tell me how to do it. <laughs> it's, you know, it's perhaps a little misguided, but 
the emotion is sincere and it shows that these places offer something that a lot of people need. And I count myself in that category. Um, when I try to explain it, um, I often think of this poem by Gary Snyder. And if you just want to read the last sentence, that's the one that gets to me. In this burning, <clears throat> pardon me, muddy, lying, blood-drenched world, that quiet meeting in the mountains, cool and gentle as the muzzles of three elk, helps keep me sane. And that's something that means a lot to me. And I think it's something that explains why we're all here tonight. Um, and that's all I have to say. Is it still on? Thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm Chuck Manning, also from the Lookout Association. And um, <laughs> it's on your way. as a token appreciation for uh, the presentation that you did this evening, uh, I, uh, we have a little, a little something that we want to give you. Uh, it is something that uh, Tom Roberts put together. Uh, let me grab you. Holy right. crap, Joe. <laughs> I knew I had to bump you again. Chuck. You want to hold on to this? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. So there's a picture of it up on the screen. Oh that my gosh. The original painting by John Roberts. That is, I have to see a bad look at. Oh my gosh. That's, you've just made my year. That's, that's incredible. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And also to close this up a little bit, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask uh, Mark? Oh, we have one right here. Mark, do you know if there's any uh, pictures of Pioneer? I've seen some photos of Pioneer. Um, there's a book called Fire Lookouts of the Northwest by Ray Krasik. Pardon? Well, the one that I'm thinking of uh, is on tower legs. It was 20 or 30 feet tall. Uh, legs out of, that were made out of logs. And that probably is the one that was there when you were, were there. Uh, that one collapsed in a winter storm um, probably 15 years ago now. And um, I'm pretty sure there are some photos of that. Um, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can give you a couple spots to look. Anyone else? Is there still a mining claim? Is there still a mining claim in the Bastion Lookout area? <laughs> I have been trying for years to find that damn mining claim. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, uh, if you look at a map, there are two patented mining claims almost at the very summit of Mount Baptiste. And if you look at the patents, it talks about adits that go into the mountain, both from the east and the west side of the ridge. And I have spent hours hours, hours glassing that ridge looking for something and have not found it. My understanding though is that the patents um, have, and I'm not sure how this happened, the patents have been resolved and the land is not federal. But yeah. There are a bunch of other mining claims in that area as well. If you hike the Baptiste Trail, there's an old mining claim that's right on the trail. You can see the adit going in. And there are several others down lower in the canyon that were that were developed in the middle years of the last century. Um, 
the individual for whom Baptiste Mountain is named was a prospector, as you guys might know. Um, I'll tell you a real fast story about him before I give the thing back to Chuck, because it's a great story. Um, he spent the summers prospecting for copper, spent the winters trapping, lived in a cabin uh, a little south of the Baptiste area down by the river, just him and his dog. And in the winter of, I think, 1909, he was an old man by that time, and he, he passed away during the middle of the winter in the cabin alone. The dog was still there, and the dog realized that it needed some human companionship. And so in the middle of winter, the dog trekked all the way from Baptiste to Martin City to find a person. Aww. And when the dog arrived in town, um, the townspeople knew whose dog it was, and they knew that that meant that Baptiste had died. And they got the sheriff, and they got some sleds, and went back up the canyon to find his body. So you got to love a dog story. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, one off, real one off. Yeah. So obviously throughout the years, the Forest Service has always been a big name in Africa. What was the general attitude of the Forest Service? Was it just targeting them towards an Africa? Or was it like, hey, this is important to us. We feel for you. Well, that's a that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'll try to summarize the question: Is how can those of us who see the value in fire lookouts encourage the continued use and operation of these facilities? And, and you know, and of course, I'm a federal employee at this point, and I have a lot of respect for the fire managers of the Flathead. Um, they are doing amazing things with the kinds of resources that they have, and they don't have enough resources uh, to do it all. And I think they understand that the lookouts that we do have here serve a purpose. And I feel really good about that relationship. Um, I respect those guys immensely. There's a lot of talk. Um, outside of the flathead about tech that is is newer and shinier that will make you know all the old tech obsolete and that's that's something that our world sees happen in pretty much every aspect of our lives these days uh, there are drones that are supposedly better there are satellites that are supposedly better infrared cameras and so forth uh, some forests in Oregon have gotten rid of, of, their, of their staff lookouts and replaced them with cameras. And then they hire a guy to sit at the ranger district all day long and stare at video screens. I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say that they're doing that wrong, although obviously I have my preferences. But I think the thing about a fire lookout um, is that it's incredibly efficient and incredibly cost effective at the same time. We're in an era when expenditures sometimes are subject to scrutiny. And if you spend several hundred thousand dollars on a camera system at a fire lookout that needs to be replaced and in a decade, is that a wise use of taxpayer resources compared to spending ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year to have somebody sitting up there. I think, I don't want to sound like a Luddite, but I think cost effectiveness is a factor. And I think we need to, as a society, and, and not just on this subject, something newer and shinier isn't automatically better. And being progressive while still getting that message across in broader terms is the key, and that filters down to a subject like this one. Okay, one more question for Bernie. Well, okay, can you yell out loud or do you want this? <laughs> 
there are a number of lookouts that are open as rentals. Um, in Montana, uh, lookouts that are staffed are not available to rent and lookouts that are rented are typically not staffed. Um, there are several in, in our part of the world. The Kootenai has a number of them, uh, quite a few down on the Lolo as well, and three and down on the Bitter Red. Um, you can go to recreation.gov to look for those rentals. Uh, they open rentals about six months in advance of the date you want to be there. And they are incredibly popular. So if you want to rent a lookout six months from tomorrow, you need to be on your computer at eight o'clock and five seconds tomorrow morning <laughs> to reserve it. Um, but the ones that we staff today are not up in our part of the world. The ones we staff are not available to rent. Okay, thank you again. Thank you, uh, Mark. We, uh, we appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.